Hey, what's going on, everybody out there? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and today I'm do- joined by Macham Mo. Did I get that? Did you yes, feel sir. okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, and if you're new to our show, please check out WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com for everything that we've got there. Every episode we've ever done is available there, and you can also check out Whistlekick.com to see all the things that we're doing in our mission to connect, educate, and entertain the traditional martial arts of the world. But enough about me and about that. We're here to talk about you. So, Mr. Mo, how are you? Thanks for being here. Appreciate your time. What's going on? Hey, I'm doing great and excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, you know, when you guys for... reached out, I was like, whistle kick. I never heard of these guys. And then, you know, I got a message from Andrew. I'm like, man. And I started, I checked out a couple of episodes. I checked out the one you guys did with, um, um, what's her name? She's a movie star. Um, Cynthia Rothrock? Cynthia Rothrock, yeah. that one. I'm like, wow, these guys are legit. So, you know, I'm like, all right, let's see what this is about. And I'm glad to be here. Thank you. We, we've been blessed that so many people have said yes when we asked them to come on the show. And, and uh, you know, that's the difference because you asked me into the audience, you know. Yeah. Um, there, there's always chat before we start recording. And, and that was one of the questions you asked me, you know, kind of like, What's some of the history on this? And and that's the big difference between here we are now in our ninth year, 800 and whatever episodes versus the beginning. The beginning, I'd reach out to people and say, will you come on this show? And they would say, who are you? What's Whistlekick? What's a podcast? You know, all these questions. And now we get yes. Yeah. And Absolutely. that makes life so much easier. And because of that, we're just we're, we're really blessed with who we get to connect with. Yeah. Including yourself. Thank you. I appreciate that. So it, it is a martial arts show. And the one question that we really have, and I ask it in all sorts of different ways, it's about the beginning. There's a beginning to your path as a martial artist. So why don't you tell us about that? What, what's that first step on your martial arts journey look like? Man, you want the short or the long answer? I want the oh. long. We got time. I want the yeah, long answer. The long answer. Okay. Yeah. So... It's a two part, really, what got me um, into martial arts. The very first reason, you know, growing up in the 70s um, and in a very poor country in um, West Africa. I I am from Senegal, Mm -hmm. which is a um, French speaking country on the uh, west side of Africa. And by the way, if I do say something that you don't understand, just, you know, let me know and I will say it again because. You know, with my accent, sometimes I put the accent on the wrong syllable. And then, you know, <laughs> so far, different. you're doing great. I have, <laughs> okay. I, I've understood everything you've said thus far. Very good. So very I, good. I think we'll be good. good, but I appreciate that. So, you know, um, for me, growing up in the in that country and where particularly the town I grew up in, entertainment consisted mostly of soccer, you know, with like a little cloth ball, you know, just grab a bunch of cloth, tie it in a knot, and then you have something to kick around. So that was my childhood, you know, and that was the entertainment. So it was interesting that at the time, most of the movie, so to speak, movie theaters were only shown Bruce Lee movies. Mm -hmm. And um, it kind of like got my attention when I saw the first Bruce Lee movie ever and watching this guy move. I'm like, man, I want to be like this guy. I want to be, because I was a skinny kid. Like, I want to do what this guy does. This is impressive. So from there, every chance I got to sit and watch a Bruce Lee movie, I took that opportunity. I basically saw all of the Bruce Lee movies and Mm -hmm. probably can recite them all to you. Uh, So that was my first introduction to the martial arts, because I wanted to be like Bruce Lee. And as you can see, I have a lot of Bruce Lee figures uh, behind me on my on the shelf there. Um, he's my inspiration to start martial arts. That was back in 1988, 1989, so to speak, um, while I was in school. And But I was not really serious about it because I didn't have any formal training at the time. I couldn't afford to go to a martial arts school and take classes. And even if I could, there were very few martial arts schools in my area where I was. And when I say few, I'm talking maybe like one. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, 
and I couldn't afford it. So, you know, it was mostly like me watching a Bruce Lee movie um, and then going in my backyard and trying to imitate uh, what I learned. You're certainly not the first person to to do that. To do that? Or you're training okay. in that way. Yeah, yeah we've heard yeah, that. I would imagine that. People. But anyway, so that's kind of like how it started for me. Mm -hmm. um, but I was in a very serious practitioner because I was not part of a school, part of a system that would force me to go. So I would practice whenever I could. And then, you know, whenever my friends would come and say, hey, you know, we have a soccer game. I'm like, all right, let's go. So soccer was always kind of like the main activity for me as far as trying to find an activity to distract me from the stresses of life. Um, and people may ask, well, you are a teenager. What really, what kind of stress do you have? Well, if you grew up the way I did, you, you, you would understand Sure. how life can be difficult um, at times. And you would also um, appreciate those moments where you can escape um, the realities and do mm -hmm. something that will take your mind off of that. Uh, so we'll just leave that one at that. That's a, that's a story for another time. But that was the, the life um, that I had. And every time I got a chance to play soccer, I did so. Now, fast forward a few years, 99, I mean, 91, 92, when I graduated from high school, um, my mom was very proud because um, I am her firstborn and she was very proud that her firstborn is off to college and uh, she wanted me to have more than a couple of pairs of outfits to wear in college. Mm -hmm. So she took me shopping and, uh, you know, I don't know, you know, if you know anything about Africa, but we don't have malls like we do here in America, you know, where you walk into the building, it's all air conditioned and you go from one store to the next and it smells good. Uh, in Senegal, it's a completely different story. The mall is outside and mm. these are like little huts, little tents that people would, it's kind of like a flea market, so to speak, yeah. you know, exactly. Okay. So, you you know, you walk around, you know, it's, there's a lot of traffic. It's loud. It's noise. It smells. It's, um, it's amazing. Multiple. It's amazing. Beautiful. So as luck would have it, as we are walking around the marketplace trying to find things to buy for me to prepare for college, my mom was wearing a golden necklace. And all of a sudden, we have this big commotion and there are these four big guys that like around us and started screaming for whatever reason I have, I had no idea what was going on, but they started cursing at us and screaming at us. And I'm, you know, being protective of my mother. I'm standing there going, well, if you guys want to travel, you have another thing coming because you're not going to touch my mom. And luckily there was a lady, one of the street vendors, saw the whole situation and realized what was going on. So she grabbed my arm, pulled, pulled me aside and explained to me that they were not intending to hurt us, but they wanted to create a distraction. So one of them would have an easy access to my mom to pull the necklace off her mm -hmm. neck. I'm like, I see now. So I went around, I went back behind my mom, I took the necklace off and I put it in my pocket and we exchanged a few mean words after that and they disappeared disaster averted. We finished our shopping. We went home and my mom is telling everybody, the rest of the family, how brave I was for standing up for her, protecting her and all that stuff. And I'm sitting in my room shaking and thinking I almost died today because if that got physical and aggressive like that, you know, I, was, I wasn't going to make it, <laughs> to, to be honest, because they were all bigger than me. And Talk about you know four 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 on one. I didn't have I didn't have any chances. But that was the also a very defining moment in my martial arts career because after that experience, I made a vow that I was gonna do something. I was gonna learn how to defend myself. That I was gonna try to uh, you know change my body and build my body basically to become a weapon so to so to speak um, not to sound too cliche but I wanted to uh, learn how to take care of myself in those situations and how to defend my family the people that I love and that was it so I started really thinking seriously about uh, martial arts training 
a friend of mine invited me to go to a Taekwondo tournament before college. So I went and I'm watching. At the time, we only knew the WTF system in Senegal, the World Taekwondo, mm -hmm. the Olympic style. So I'm watching these guys compete and I'm seeing, you know, kicks to the head, people getting knocked out left and right. And I looked at my buddy, I said, that's what I want to do because I want to learn how to knock people out too. And the very next day, um, I went to a Taekwondo school in my area and I talked to the instructor and I started training with them. And then a few weeks later, I left for college and I'm going, oh my God, I just started this amazing thing. And now I'm off to college and I'm going to have to stop. And I was devastated. And then when I went to college, there was a karate program. So I started learning karate with the guys. There was also like Vovinam, Vietvoda. I don't know if you are familiar with that um, martial arts system. No, say it again. Vovinam, V-O-V-I-N-A-M. So check it out. It's called Vovinam, Vietvoda. Uh, okay, -E yes. I, 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 I don't know that I would have been able to to say it. I didn't write, yeah. but, but the way... When spelling it, yeah, that's right. Familiar. Exactly. Um, so one another friend of mine in college was practicing that. So I did a couple of sessions with them. Um, I didn't have the flexibility it required to fly up and cross my legs around somebody's neck and go down with them. Uh, and I karate, you know, really didn't appeal to me. You know, nothing against karate, but I just didn't appeal to me as the art that I wanted to do. Um, yeah. tried a little bit of Kung Fu again, same as Vovinam Viet, but I didn't have the flexibility because I'm a little too tall for that, I suppose. And luckily, there was a uh, one of the uh, people in college was also doing Taekwondo and he started a Taekwondo program. He wasn't, he wasn't even a black belt at the time. He was just a red belt, but he saw the need that people, there was no Taekwondo. There's Judo, there's Karate, and Vovinam and And he saw that these people that were teaching these sessions were not even black belt. He goes, why not? So uh, I have my red belt, you know, so we can start a program and just have fun. So it started as, let's get together, let's train, let's have fun. But that became soon a very serious activity. So every year, um, you know, I would do that in college. And then in the summer, when I go to, uh, to see my family, I would go back to that um, school and I would continue to train. So that's kind of like how I started my journey in the martial arts. Um, and this was around 92 that I became very serious about it. Okay. Wow. Well. a lot there there's a lot we can go to and you can yeah. probably see, see the wheels turning my head and wondering wondering where where we go um i want to i want to go back and i want to talk about the taekwondo that you saw before college right so yeah. the okay and then and, and where did you go to college so <coughs> excuse me um I went to college in a city in the north part of Senegal called St. Louis. That's okay. the name of the city. Um, at the time, there was only one university in Senegal, which was in Dakar, the capital of the country. Mm -hmm. And three years prior, that university was open. So I was like third generation to attend oh, wow. that university. So there was not like, there were maybe a total of a thousand students, if that. So it was like a deserted area um, when I when I when I went. Okay. So and that was our so life, you know. Everything was new. Everything was right? new. So, exactly. so, and and that's kind of interesting. And this is kind of the sense that I was getting as you're talking about all of these different martial arts, all of these different opportunities. For most of us, when we go to college, when we go to university, it's new for us. Yeah. But this was new for everyone. Everyone. Totally brand and, new. And there's a there, there's something really interesting to me about that. And I imagine that the martial arts culture, you know, a lot of times people go go to college, they, they go somewhere and they're they're training in a bunch of different things, but they're it's uncommon that that, that happens. Most people, I do this martial art, but I'm going to guess, and, and tell me if I'm wrong. Right that you weren't the only one like this, that because so much of that was new, that everybody was going, oh, you do this? Well, I do this. And there was a lot of sharing. 
That is correct. And you, you are absolutely correct. And as a matter of fact, because of that, to promote the martial arts as part of the university culture, so to speak, um, we would organize occasionally like this big martial arts night, we call it, mm. right? Where we would collaborate, you know, uh, we get together with other arts. So let's say the Taekwondo folks will come and we'll, it was like a night of demonstration. So we'll do our Taekwondo demonstration. The, the Viet Vodau guys would do their demonstrations. Um, the karate guys would do their demonstrations. And then at the end, what we do is we come together. So let's say one year I was paired up with a judoka, a, a, a mm -hmm. person that practices judo. And so we would show different self-defense techniques. So I attack. Uh, and so he attacks me and I do my dodging, my kicks and all that stuff. And it's fun. The crowd applauds. We're like, yes. And then I attack him and he takes me down. I thought the first time it happened, I thought I was going to die. Because when he dropped me, I didn't know how to fall. All I know <laughs> is that as, as I'm reaching over to grab him, I find myself upside down. And I hit the mat so hard that I lost my breath. It was incredible. And, you know, the benefit to that was you see stuff like that and you're like, okay, I realized Taekwondo is mostly striking and Judo is like pinning and taking you down and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So it created this uh, friendly atmosphere where we would kind of like cross train. So, you know, I would do my Taekwondo uh, and then the Judo people would come and we'll teach them some striking and then we will go to the Judo classes and they will teach us some grappling and some ways to pin people down and same as the, you know, Kung Fu at the time, Jiu Jitsu, Jiu -Jitsu is very, very new in Senegal, like mm -hmm. in the last couple of years. Uh, so at the time there was no Jiu Jitsu, but Judo is, Judo was like one of the first arts to ever enter the country. Mm -hmm. So it's very prevalent in Senegal. So we would do kind of like that. So you learn a little bit from the other systems uh, while men remaining true to the one that you really uh, are driven to. So that was that was a that was a cool experience. Yeah. Okay. I think I heard you say yeah. when you first saw Taekwondo, this is the martial art for me. You said something along those lines. That is correct. But when you were exposed to all these other things, did that change? No, not at all. Okay. Not at all, because I still like the striking and it suited my body type. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a little taller, so, and I had fast legs that I could stand my ground in like a striking. And I liked the idea of really getting in the ring with another opponent who's just as good as you are, maybe even better, and trying to figure out a way to knock him out. Mm -hmm. that was the main motivation for me to really do it it, it. it takes a lot of skill to be in the heat of the moment when everything is moving so fast to see that quick opening and be able to score that point, whether it's just a point or you hit them hard enough that you knock them out. So that was the idea. Now, obviously things have changed since then and people don't spar like that. And, you know, and when I say knock them out, Basically, everything we did was bare knuckles. We didn't have mm -hmm. gloves because we were poor. We didn't have the means to buy gloves or the protective gear that was required. So, you know, you come as you are and you fight as you are. So I'd be like in my shorts, in my T-shirts, and that, that was it. They, this was basically like a street brawl. It was, but that suited me because for me, it was a survival skill that I needed to learn. And to learn that I needed to be in it and feel it and be able to understand how I can defend against it and try to make somebody else pay the price, so to speak, if, if, if what I'm saying makes sense. Yeah. So that was it. However, I will say this. That's not what kept me in it. Yes, that's not what kept okay. me in it. And I think maybe... I'm not trying to take this conversation. No, in no, a way that please, please do. Please do. Let's, let's when, see where this takes us. Because, you know, my life was never, was not always easy. Okay. And rumor has, ex I'm so sorry. I should have turned this off. I thought okay. I did. All right. Quite all right. 
I'm so sorry. I thought I turned the ringer off, but I uh, missed it. So. We, we've had over the years, we've had some 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 very interesting uh, interruptions. Yes, we'll just, I we'll just leave it at that. Not not e that's not even top ten. Please continue. <laughs> so, rumor has it hmm. that when I was a kid and a teenager, I had a temper hmm. that I was quick to anger, and me learning that was kind of a way, in a way, to let go of that anger or to express that anger. But that was not the, the whole thing. The whole story for me was I just wanted to learn how to defend myself because I've lived a hard life up to that point. And I didn't want that life to continue be my existence, what defines me as a human being. So, but I wanted to learn skills that I, if I were ever in a situation like that, I could assert myself, I could stand for, I could stand my ground. And I say that's not what kept me in the art, but that's the reason why I did it. I wanted to learn how to, so to speak, hurt anybody who's trying to hurt me or hurt my family. That was the motivation. But that's not what kept me in it. What kept me in it, after we had our very first test, my very first test in the art to, pro, to promote to a next level. That was like going from white belt to yellow belt. And, and just, uh, I want to make sure, because we've gone all over the place. Yes. How old were you? I was about 18, 19. I just graduated okay. from high school. Okay. So, yes, when I started really being serious in the art, I was like 18 years old. Okay. So this is my first year in college, um, like 19 or so. I'm old. <laughs> so, I've done the math. You're not old. Because if you're old, then I'm almost old. So, almost. so, we're, so you're not old. <laughs> so after the test, um, this guy came from Dakar, the capital of Senegal, and he administered mm -hmm. the test. There was a few of us testing. The room was hot, sweaty. And then he asked the question, how do you feel about the test? And we're like, very proud. We did a great job. We thought we did a great job. And we thought we deserved our next rank and we were too excited. And then he said to us, yes, physically, you did very well. You know, you did everything you were supposed to do. Um, you met all the requirements to promote to the next level. And then he said, however, I want you to understand this very important lesson. Taekwondo is never about being the strongest person in the room or the best fighter in the room. Taekwondo is always about being the best person in the room in all aspects of your life. Not just as an athlete, but as a human being. You need to understand what matters in life most. And that's not being the strongest person, because no matter how strong you are, there is always somebody who's stronger than you. No matter how skilled you are, there is always somebody who's more skilled than you are. And all that physical skill you have, as you age, your physical abilities will start to diminish. So that, if you never measure your, your skill, yourself, based on your physical abilities, because that's going to change. If nothing else, try to compete within yourself, not just what you can do physically, but how do you make yourself a better person? How do you make yourself more successful in your life? And how do you change lives? And that lesson... I never forget. And then he looked at us and said, all of you are students, you are going to college. And you are doing that because you want to build a better life for yourselves. You want to be successful in life. Make college your priority. Make school your priority. Be the best student you can be. So long as you're doing that and you are being a better version of yourself every day, you are indeed representing Taekwondo in the best of ways possible. That lesson stayed with me forever. He went on to say, this is something that you also need to remember. The best gift you can give a human being is the gift of life. And then he said, let me explain. If you train in the martial arts and you get to a certain level of expertise and you have the skills, you're going to realize just how easy it is to hurt a person. When you get to that level and somebody is trying to pick a fight with you or do something physical with you, 
making you angry and you look at that person knowing full well what you can do and you choose to walk away from that, you are giving that person the gift of life. And that changed my whole views about martial arts. What motivated me to want to learn how to knock people out, how to defend myself, hurt anybody who wants to hurt me, I no longer had that desire. No longer had that desire. I competed, but I did never, I didn't compete at that point. Like, I'm going to see how fast I can knock this person out. I competed a whole lot because I wanted to test my skills against the very best and see how far I've come and how much I still have to learn. So that was my motivation for even entering the ring, not to win. I wanted to win, but I wanted to most, more importantly, see how far I've come and how much I still have to learn. Because every fight I ever lost was a lesson for me mm. to improve, to go back in the gym and train even harder. We got to the point where we knew each other so well that uh, we would go to a tournament, I would win, and the person would, we would finish the match, he would look at me and say, man, how did you score that point? And I would look at him and say, hey, this is what you did. That's why I was, I saw that and I did this and that's what happened. And then I would invite him to come to my gym. We would train together or vice versa that they did for me as well. And that created that friendship, that bond. And that made me realize this is what martial arts is all about. This is about bringing people together, helping people, elevating people so everybody succeeds. So as soon as that instructor said that, I just decided, you know what? He is right. This is, I can change my life by applying myself more and not paying any attention to what anybody says or not paying any attention to how people feel about me. And that just changed my attitude about everything. I cannot care less if people doubt me, I'm still gonna prove them wrong. That's the best thing I can do. When people started being mean and telling me you are gonna be a nobody, you will not achieve this, you will not achieve that. I just laugh at it and I keep working hard too because I know what I'm capable of. So that changed everything and uh, I started making school more of a priority. So my life in college was basically get up in the morning, go to school, after that, go to the cafeteria, eat lunch, come back to my dorm room, maybe do some homework, stretch, do something. And then in the evening, go to Taekwondo, come back, do my homework, get up the next day, repeat. Mm -hmm. And I did that for four years, my four years in college. I did that. And as luck would have it, not to say that I'm the smartest, but I, I was able to maintain high enough grades that when I graduated from college, getting ready to go to um, graduate school, we had an exchange program between UW Madison, the University of Madison here in Wisconsin, mm -hmm. and my university back home, there was an exchange program. And I was blessed enough to be awarded a, um, a full scholarship mm -hmm. to come to Madison to pursue my graduate school. And coming here opened also so many doors for me that I wouldn't have had in Africa. And I attribute all that to Taekwondo because had I not met that gentleman who told me, don't focus on your physical abilities, focus on making yourself better in men mentally and to build a better life, being a good student and all that stuff. Had I not met that person to give me that advice, that lesson, I don't know where I would have been or where I would be right now. Mm -hmm. So I attribute that uh, to Taekwondo and coming here, uh, I really seized that opportunity to do well in school while here. And as luck would have it, after my program was over, I still had a little bit of time left on my visa. So the dorm that I was staying in, the owner of that dorm said, you know, I said, hey, I have some time, it's the summer. I have some time left on my visa and he goes, I can give you a job if you know. So he gave me a job um, and I was cleaning the property, making the beds, cleaning rooms and doing all that stuff. And he gave me a room to stay for free while I was still here. I'm like, why not? Perfect. So that was weird. Uh, and that same summer, I went to a job fair with a friend of mine who was living here that I got to know. So he was looking to switch jobs. 
-hmm. and there was a job fair here and we went to it and um, we walking around and I saw this lady, you know, can I say this? So I saw this lady, I thought she was hot. I'm like, I need to talk to her. So I, you know, I came and I started talking to her and she's like, you know what? I really like your personality. I like your, how the ease with which you communicate. I think we may have something for you. Why don't you come see me Monday and then we'll talk. And I'm like, yeah, right. My visa is going to expire here soon in the next few months. So she goes, don't worry about that. Just come and let's talk. So this was a telephone company that was in town. So that very Monday, I went to the office and I met with her and she called another manager and they hired me on the spot as a customer service representative because mm -hmm. they thought that I had good enough personality and I could be good on the phone. Okay. And I explained my visa situation and then they hired me still and then started talking to the president of the company and they decided all of them uh, that the company was going to help me, sponsor me so I could get my green card so I could stay in the country. As luck would have it, I was the very first black person that company ever hired. And I, this was a brand new company starting and I was the very first black person. So that was a way for them to also show inclusiveness, inclusiveness and diversity. Now, needless to say, the initial goal that I had to talk with, uh, in talking to that lady never happened because she was married, she was beautiful. And ah, bummer. I was, I was hoping that's where the story was going to go. You were going to get a job exactly. and a green card and a wife, and then she was going to come on screen. But no, okay. But All we right, became best friends. And to this day, we still, we still talk. Oh, that's we great. Still, we still talk. And, 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 and I met my wife at that in that company also. So okay, yeah. so we're not too far it off out. on that story it then. It worked out. It worked out. <laughs> <laughs> it worked out. So that's what happened there. And that's how mm -hmm. I got to stay in the country. And uh, voila, this was uh, yeah. back in 99 that I started working there. I worked there for five years. Um, eventually, I left the company and I started working in the martial arts business. And then in 2010, I my wife and I, we bought this location from a gentleman and we grew it. And here we are. Now we are silver line in Taekwondo. And, yeah. and we're going we're to talk about that in, yeah. in a minute. But I want to go back because this this is such an important arc in the story that you're telling this. And, and it's something that I think people are more willing to talk about now than they used to be. And that is that the benefits of martial arts, the majority of them have nothing to do with self-defense. That is correct. That all of, all of the, the benefits that, you know, we, we all know what they are. We talk about them. We advertise them in newspapers and, and online for kids' classes. We seem to forget that these have continuing benefits for all of us, regardless of our age. That's to, right. to not just build, but maintain focus, discipline, and, and in, increase the quality of our character. You know, we, we've heard this over the hundreds of episodes that we've done from nearly every guest, whether they say it directly or indirectly. These are good people. Martial artists are overall good people. And, I, and in my opinion, martial artists as a group are better than the average person, right? If martial arts makes us better, better versions of ourselves, then martial artists are better people. There's some logic in there. And, you know, I, I think, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like if we put all the pieces together, we could say, if it were not for Taekwondo, you wouldn't have met your wife, you wouldn't have moved to Wisconsin, you, you wouldn't have gotten this job, right? Like so much of, of your life today Right. would not be there without Taekwondo. You'd have a very different life. That is correct. That is 100% accurate. So, yes. And the benefits of martial arts that you're talking about, you know, it got to a point where it almost became cliche. Mm. But it is so true, though. It is so true um, because, first of all, you have to be disciplined to practice any art because it's mm. not easy. You have to be disciplined to practice it. You have to be dedicated to keep go doing it, right? That perseverance. And, and what happens, even sometimes without the person realizing it, 
as you are continuing to train, you are developing those skills and they will seep out in other areas in your life. Like some martial arts, not everybody um, that practices martial arts does it for a living. A lot of us have other jobs, um, but the same discipline we apply in our training without even sometimes consciously thinking about it, we are applying that same discipline in our jobs. We are applying that same discipline in our relationships, right? So yes, uh, whether we talk about it or not, those benefits are there. And for me, knowing what my childhood was like and what I had to overcome to get to where I am, and knowing the doors that Taekwondo opened for me, uh, now, when I say that, I want to go back a step and say I'm a man of faith as well. So I know everything is by divine intervention. Mm -hmm. That's through martial arts that God worked to open the doors for me. So when I say Taekwondo, yes, but we, I, I also am a firm believer that everything came from above. And that's the way it, you know, we always say God works in mysterious ways. In my case, what, 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 what's, what, what's more mysterious of a method then? Okay, I'm going to, um, I want you to go become friends with people by kicking and punching them in the head. And uh, that that's that's how I'm going to work through you. Yeah, yeah. I, I could, it's, I couldn't, I couldn't it's such a weird better. thing that we do, but it, <laughs> at the same time makes so much sense. Right? I couldn't have said it any better. So there you go. Um, right. So being a living proof of the power of Taekwondo and the power of martial arts. Mm. That's w why I am so motivated to do what I'm doing now, because I know if it helped me, it can help others. Yeah. And as long as I'm in that position that I can instill in my students the same values that I learned through the art and the same um, persistence, so to speak, that helped me get to where I am. If I can help my students see that and realize that mm -hmm. and understand their potential and truly work towards that potential, then my, my, I cannot think of a better job to yeah. have in this world. Now, rank isn't the, the thing that I'm most interested in generally, but we, we, we've talked about a couple bookends here. Yeah. You know, last we heard about rank from you, you, you were, you were in Senegal and, and you had had, I think you said your first test. Yeah. And now we just heard a couple minutes ago, you have a school. Yep. Most martial artists never go on to teach for anyone else, let alone own a school. Yep. You must have kept going, kept progressing, learning. At some point started teaching, found that you enjoyed it and all of these things happen. So talk about that because I want, I want to know how that all happened. <laughs> so yeah. Um... We, we, yeah, my wife and I, we have a, we have a school. We have a very large school. Um, it's over 8,000 square feet in, uh, in Madison. D does she also train? No. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, oh, there's a story there. Your face says there's a story there. <laughs> she, let's just <laughs> we say. We don't have to tell it, but. A few, year, a few years ago, she decided she was going to train. And then she would come to class. And then yeah, I would say, everybody come to attention. And all the students would say, yes, sir. And then she would go, yes, honey. That's not how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's not how it goes. So, yeah, um, I've been doing Taekwondo for going on 34 years. I am a very, very, very beginner in the art. I'm, an, I'm, a, I'm a novice. And I've been teaching for the last 30 or so. I'm, I'm 52 years old now. So when I worked at the telephone company that I talked about, what, how I started um, and stayed here, after I left, I had a couple of other jobs in corporate America. So I worked in corporate America for 10 years. And then in 2007, I worked for a company here in town, a very big company, and I uh, was doing very well. My father was really sick at the time. And then I got a call from my brothers and say, um, and they told me that there was not a whole lot of hope. And if I wanted to see dad alive, I better come home. Mm. And our son was just a year and a half at the time. And my wife was very adamant that if this was gonna be dad's end he needed to meet his grandson before he went 
So I went to the company and I told him my, my, my father was very, very ill and I needed to go see him, but they wouldn't give me the time. You know, yes, that happened. They wouldn't give me the time. Um, and they told me that they couldn't stop me from going, but when I came back, they couldn't guarantee that I would still have a job. Well, obviously, I don't even need to tell you what I decided to do. <laughs> so we right. went. And then when we came back two weeks later, uh, yeah, they let me go. And then as luck would have it, again, the Lord works through in mysterious ways. One of my wife's friends said, hey, you know, much, I know that Machami um, is in Taekwondo and he's been training. He's been teaching at the school. This guy, you know, through Craigslist of all places, this guy um, just posted on Craigslist that he's looking for a, a Taekwondo teacher. And I thought my child should apply. And my wife told me about it. At the time, I'm like, you know, that's a joke because people don't do Taekwondo martial arts full time, you know. Uh, people have daytime jobs and then they teach in the evening. So nobody, you know, it's not a full time job. She says, she said to me, what do you have to lose? Just apply. I'm like, fine. So I sent the email, it bounced. And then I said, told you this was a joke. And she said, try again. So I sent another email and the very next day, the gentleman responded and said, I need to meet with you because looking at your resume and your background, I think I have something bigger for you than just a, just, just, just a teacher. So we met and um, he was a stunt person. And at the time he mm. got a gig to work on the movie uh, Public Enemy with Johnny Depp. Mm -hmm. So he was um, hired to work on that movie and he said, I was looking for a teacher, but looking at your background, I have two locations and I want to hire you as a general manager if you are interested. And I said, I am, but I am currently training with another gentleman and I don't want to take a job without his blessings because I would be working for his competition if I did. He says, I respect that. So I talked to my teacher at the time and he said to me, absolutely not, that he was not going to allow it. If I went to train, if I went to work for this gentleman, he was done being my teacher. Mm -hmm. And then he said, he offered me, he said, I cannot pay you as much as he's paying you, but if you want to work at the school and help me grow it, then we can talk about that. And I called this gentleman back and I said to him, thank you for the opportunity, but you know, my loyalty is to my teacher I, and he is not, he's not um, with it. So I'm not going to take the job. And he said, no problem. So I went and I started working for my teacher. And then after about a month, he told me that he couldn't afford to pay me anymore. And I needed to find another job. And if I were interested in taking that job at the other martial arts school, he had my blessings. Mm -hmm. That made my wife very, very, very unhappy because I turned down a job that was paying me as much as I was making in corporate America. Yeah. Um, so to only about a month or so later, find myself looking for another job. So my wife told me, call him back and tell him that you are still interested if the job is open. My pride wouldn't let me do that. Mm. So she's insisted, you know, I don't know what I would do or where I would be also without my wife right now. I got to tell you that. Um, she's an amazing woman. So she says, you need to swallow your pride and call. You never know, but you want to know unless you try. So I called him back and he said, yes, you have a very good background and I'm very interested. However, I cannot pay you as much as I offered you initially because I had to hire somebody else for cert. And I understood that. But he wanted to hire me because he appreciated my loyalty. He appreciated that I wasn't just going to jump ship just because I could make more money and stuff. So that was in January 2008. I started working with this gentleman. He was doing a completely different, you know, I was, I grew up in traditional Taekwondo. He was doing more like the American sport Taekwondo. Mm -hmm. So I started working with him. And two years after that, he came to us and said, uh, hey, do you want to purchase this location? Because I'm thinking of um, stepping away and I want to sell this one location and uh, we talked a little bit and I said sure we you know but 
that was around in the height of the market crash. Yeah. Banks, banks were not lending money. Yeah, nobody was giving anybody nobody money. Nobody was giving anybody any money. And as luck would have it, that same year I started working with him in 2008, I'm sitting in the office one afternoon and this gentleman walks in, shorts, T-shirts, earrings, tattoos, loud. He walks in and says, I want to train. I want to learn self-defense. And uh, I don't have time to do evening classes. This is the only time that I have during the day. And I want to learn self-defense. How much and can you do that? I just came from down the street and I talked to that gentleman over there and they want to allow, they want to do any lunch hour classes because they don't start until four o'clock and I cannot do evening classes. I'm like, let's talk. What do you want to learn? I want to learn self-defense. My wife and I, we take a lot of trips to Chicago and the streets are not safe. So I want to learn how to protect her if anything happens. I said, okay, let's do it. Let's go. And so we started, I started training him during his lunch hours as little to man. You know, as when you work one-on-one -on -one with somebody, you get to know a little bit about them. You talk and then we became very good friends. Turned out this guy is a multimillionaire, but you want to know it just by the way he's the most humble person i've ever met a multimillionaire owns his own company does very well uh but you wouldn't know so he said and when i told him the opportunity that you know this gentleman uh, offered to sell me the school he said it's about time because i was going to talk to you about starting your own school because you are too good to work for somebody else and he said if he's willing to sell let's negotiate it i will help you buy it Hmm. Just like that. So we negotiated. We came to uh, to an agreement, and um, he just go all right. He wrote the check, and that was it. That's how we became school owners. That was wow. in 2010, and to this day we're still running it. We rebranded it. We changed it a little bit um, in 2016 to make it even better, and we added some programs like an after school program. We are uh, we are blessed. You look really happy as you're talking about this. I am very, very happy, very I blessed. Tell, yeah. Doing what so, I love to do, making mm -hmm. an impact on people's lives and taking care of my family at the same time. I'm, I'm very better? blessed. Yeah. What surprised you most between the difference of being an instructor, an employee, and owning and running the school what what was the the part that made you go i didn't even think about this or i didn't know about this or this was bigger or smaller or surprising anything like that yes and the big thing was growing the business and also um finding the right people and they taking care of them because when i started um, working for this gentleman the second location that we we currently own was kind of like relatively new so growing it to that point and having to find the right people to work in it and teach uh, was also a challenge. And that at that time, it was the economy was still a little shaky. So buying it and I didn't sleep much at night because it was always like, wow, when you are working in it and you're just getting paid, you don't really think about all everything that goes behind the scenes that pays your salary. But being the owner that was a big awakening like i have to pay the rent i have to pay the taxes i have to pay the employees and every time somebody would come and say hey you know what uh we can't afford to continue training we need to drop i'm like oh my goodness what am i gonna do people are leaving i have all these responsibilities so that was a big shock uh, but you know like everything else if you learn and you are dedicated, um, you, you you start to learn the ways to uh, make it make it work. But the biggest thing for me was the fear of failure and the fear of failing the people that work for me because their livelihood depends on the success of this organization as well. Um, we try to pay our employees very well. We have a good staff and we want to keep them because you cannot just walk off the streets and put an ad and hire people to become martial arts instructors. You know, they have to have the knowledge. It's a very skilled uh, business. So we want to maintain the people we have and we want to pay them well enough that they don't desire to go anywhere. But 
that means we have to find more ways to make revenue, uh, either increasing the student account or developing new programs. Gotta, then it's always it's it's a fun challenge. You know, it's stressful, but it's fun challenge because it's like a game you're playing with yourself. Like, mm-hmm. where you know, where do I go from here? How do I make this better? And so, so it's it's very it's very interesting, and I like it. Good, good. If how have you changed? Not not just in, in terms of a you know, now now you own a school, but how about as an instructor? You've had a lot more time on the mats and, you know, you've, you've been around a lot of people you've had employees. I'm sure you've said, Oh, I like the way they do that. So if we were to watch, you know, let, let's say we all had some, some video of you teaching today versus 10, 15 years ago, what would we notice different? I got a lot smarter about the way I teach because mm-hmm. Early on, when I was when I started teaching, or when I was a student, or well, I'm still a student, when I was um, learning, it was all about how hard, how hard can I make the class? <laughs> really, how you know you if you left the class and your legs were not shaking, it was not a hard enough class. But mm. that didn't necessarily mean we were doing it safely. So ever since uh, that we purchased this location, the first thing I did was to become certified as a trainer because I wanted to understand how the body works. I didn't want to just like make a class so intense that people leave and never want to come back because they are too sore to come back the next day. Mm. Or make the class so intense when people may have some physical limitations or um, injuries or things that they are nurturing and I'm pushing them to the limit and make it worse. So I needed to mm-hmm. understand, to find that delicate balance of making the class in, hard enough that the people feel they are working harder, but doing it in a smart way. So I'm a lot smarter about the way I teach and I make the class more entertaining. And, you know, cause I want to capture the kids' attention. We have adult classes and I teach the adults in a different way as well. Uh, but with the kids, I want to, emphasize yes this can be fun but i want to emphasize that discipline right i want to you know because unfortunately this is just my personal view we live in a time where if you give a uh, a kid a choice they will always pick that video game versus anything else yeah. right they will pick that iphone that ipad before anything else so how do i make the class fun, interesting enough that they're going to want to put that game down and attend and come to their class. But at the same time, I want them to learn that there is more to it than just having fun. I want them to learn the Mm. discipline. I want them to learn the perseverance, that indomitable spirit uh, that we talk about, everything that I learned through the art. But now we're trying to do it in a much nicer way and trying to speak the kids' language today because times have Mm. changed, times have evolved and they learn differently, they connect differently. So I'm trying to learn ways that I can better connect with them when I'm on the mat and teaching instead of just kind of like drilling them uh, to tears, right? So uh, if you watch the class, you will be entertained because, you know, I, I, I make jokes, I crack jokes, and I tell them just, as a matter of fact, a lot of the kids, they, they don't know me as Mr. Bo, they know me as Mr. Crazy. So <laughs> Every time I have a new student, I introduce myself as Mr. Crazy. And I tell them, and you're going to find out why they call me Mr. Crazy. And now they're like, whoa, right? So we get on the floor and I start cracking jokes and I do things and they laugh. And then I bring them back to the technique we are working on and then making them doing it. So, you know, it's a, it's a lot more interactive in the way I mm. teach the kids. With the adults, that's- learn a lot better when they're having fun. Exactly. They, it's, they, we, we, we know this about kids. Somehow we, we often especially in the martial arts, ignore that. Yeah. But he, here, you, you said this in a, in a rather humble way. Uh, I'm going to say it a little bit more directly. There are two kinds of instructors. There are instructors who say, I'm going to do it this way and you can come. And if that works for you, great. And if not, get out. I don't want to see you. And what I'm hearing from you is that because sharing this information, because giving the opportunities to students that Taekwondo gave to you is so important to you, you're willing to change 
who you are, where you are to meet their needs so they can get the benefits. That is correct. And I and, and that is just such a, a powerful sentiment. And it's one that I hope folks in the audience recognize it. I, I think we're getting better yeah. in the martial arts. People are, are getting better about I'm, I need to meet my students where they're at instead of trying to force them into a small box that is how I want to teach. Right. Right. But what's a teacher without students? That's right. Exactly. There you go. If you, if you want to be a teacher, you have to have students. Right. Having very high standards that no one can meet is pointless. That's correct. If they're not in your class, you can't help them. That is correct. Yes, sir. Very well said. Thank you. Okay. So what? So what's going on now? What? What? Um, you know, you talked about the enjoyment of sort of a, I would call it a puzzle of putting together a successful martial arts school and growing it while also maintaining the integrity of the art that you teach, which is a, a difficult challenge. And I'm not pretending for a moment that that is easy, but you, you've got all that you're working on. And I imagine somewhere in there, you're trying to train on your own. You have family. Um, one, how are you balancing all of that? Yeah. And two, what what are you looking forward to in the future? So the first part of that question, how am I balancing it? That is something I'm still learning. It's very difficult to balance all of that. Yeah. But one of the things we are doing is we are trying right now with the staff we have building the school where it's not personality driven. In other words, where people don't just come here because of my personality, because of me, right? I want people to come here to work with me, but I've trained my staff well enough that we are all on that same page as far as the mission and what we want to accomplish with these kids. Um, and now I'm starting to slowly pull myself off the mat because you know I do teach, I enjoy that aspect. I do teach uh, whenever I get the chance to, but as the business is growing, I do a lot of the initial uh, consults with members. So I have a lot, you know, a lot of times I'm doing that. And inevitably, people always asking me, are you going to be the one teaching the classes? Sometimes I am, but I also have a team of highly trained, qualified instructors, and you'll be working with them mostly. You will still see me, but most of the time you're going to be working with those guys. And what, sure enough, when they step on the floor, they're going to realize that the uh, uh, everything is kind of like the same as I introduced it to them, as far as the lessons, what they are learning and all that stuff. So that's starting to free me up a little bit so I can balance um, that work family life a little bit. Otherwise, up until recently, I was on that floor all the time, teaching and teaching and teaching and teaching. So it's a delicate process and not one that is so easy because it's not cut and dry, right? It's not like I do this, I do this, and then I go home, I do this. So. It's, it's, there's, there's a lot of moving pieces. So that is, balancing it is still something I'm learning and hopefully getting better at. Uh, my wife may have a different take on that, but we'll just say that we, we, we try <laughs> our best. Um, and the second part of that question, remind me again? The, the future, what, 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 you know, what, as we look out a yes, few years, what, well, what's coming, what are you looking forward to? Yes. What might change? Yes. So what I'm looking forward to right now, my wife and I, we are kind of like starting to talk about an exit strategy uh, mm. in the next 10 years or so. So we're starting to plan when our son graduates and he um, moves on his own doing stuff. Our son is a musician. He's aspiring to be a professional musician, which means mm. that he probably going to be traveling a lot more. As a matter of fact, we just came back from Atlanta yesterday um, for a show he was doing out there. Oh, cool. And uh, as that continues to grow and he continues to be successful, we want to have time to to be able to attend most of his shows and travel with him a little bit. Uh, so see the world is one of the, the goals we also have. Yeah. Uh, so that's something I'm looking forward to, building that future with my wife and following our son around and see his success as well. Uh, hopefully that's going to happen. If she were here, she would tell me, not hopefully, when it happens, she would say. Uh, she's very positive in that regard. So 
that's what we that's what we have going on. So trying to plan a, an exit strategy and grooming the staff we have right now so they can take over the business if we need to step away from it for a minute. That's great. Yeah. But I'm still training. I still train. I have a teacher. Uh, my instructor he lives out in Colorado. He's uh, mm -hmm. a ninth degree black belt. He's a grandmaster, the highest you can go in Taekwondo. Mm -hmm. So I still work with him um, right now. It's difficult because I don't have that one on one with him all the time. But I record videos, me doing my techniques and stuff, and I send them send them to him and he corrects them and we'll get on a Zoom call, he'll fix things. And then occasionally I'll travel to Colorado and we'll train for a week or so. And sometimes he'll come here and then we'll train. So we're gonna we're gonna get together again in November uh, in Maryland so I can you know continue because I'm always a student. Once a student, always a student. I agree. The, the best teachers are also students. That's correct. Yes, sir. There's always more to learn. Yes, sir. If people want to get a hold of you, website, social media, email, anything like that you you want to share? Yes. Um, you know, you can go to uh, our website is um, www.silverliningtkd.com. Uh, we are on uh, Facebook, Silver Lining Taekwondo. If you just type in Silver Lining Taekwondo, Facebook, you're going to see us. Same as Instagram, um, TikTok. We are on all the social medias and yeah, go ahead and follow us. It's going to be, it's great. We do have a lot of things coming up. We uh, try to do our part and not only impact the students we teach right now, but we also try to impact our community and serve our community. And one of the things we really pride ourselves in doing is organizing free events for the community. We have one coming up where we're going to be doing like a free women's self-defense class, mm -hmm. you know, uh, because... Things are happening in this world, and unfortunately, not all of it is good. So we just want to do true. our part and help as best as we can. And I applaud you for doing that. I just, you know, wa watching this circle, you know, watching how strongly martial arts changed your life and that, you know, it almost seems inevitable that you would end up taking a role where you can do that for so many others. And I just think that's great. And I appreciate that you've done yes, it. Sir. Audience. Whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for the links, you know, everything we talked about today, transcript, all the other good stuff in the show notes, whistlekick.com. If you're up for learning more about our mission to connect, educate, and entertain the traditional martial arts of the world. But, uh, Macham, if, if you wouldn't mind, this is, this is your time to, to close us out. What words do you want to leave the audience with today? Simple. Um, if you are currently enrolled in the martial arts, just understand that you're going to get more out of it than just physical strength. So if you are enrolled in the martial arts and you are a dedicated practitioner, don't let those challenging moments make you stop or uh, redefine, you know, your trajectory in the art. You, you keep persevering. You are better than um, what sometimes we give ourselves credit for and we can achieve anything we put our minds to. It's not always going to be easy, but definitely a road uh, worth traveling. If you are not in the martial arts or you don't have a kid in your kids enrolled in the martial arts, you should, I would strongly rec uh, advise that you consider um, signing them up for a martial arts program in your area because I firmly believe that um, having that level of discipline um, in that environment is beneficial for all children. So what I would leave people is keep training and keep believing in yourself and the sky's the limit. Always be your best. That's our motto, how we finish every class. You know, we go one, two, three, and everybody goes, oh, be your best. So always be your best. That's what it is. Always be your best. Try to always strive to be a better version of yourself today than you were yesterday. 